Okay, so let's talk about JRuby on App Engine. So first of all, it's very easy to install. Everything installs as gems. Even though it's running on JRuby, we don't uh, have you install JRuby separately. You just need to have Java running on your machine, some recent version of Ruby gems, and you install these, uh, this one gem. It brings down the other gems you need. It brings down the JRuby runtime that's packaged, uh, that we've packaged specially for you. It brings down the development environment and tools and everything you need to get going. We uh, promote for building applications the Sinatra micro framework because it is just so simple. There's no real learning curve. Also, um, some data-driven apps don't actually require a lot of MVC. If you do realize that you need to build a more complicated app, you can break your app up into controllers, basically, and create separate views and create separate models. And you have the ability to do that, but you basically do that by hand however you choose. And also, there's uh, no need to extract components out of Sinatra like you might with Rails that you can't use because there really are no extra components. Also, uh, because your app is so small, you can have new instances spin up quickly. So we also will, in theory, support Rails 3 when it is out. It should be able to be as uh, flexible as Merb has been in the past. Also, you have more intelligent gem management. Uh, Rails uh, 2 was dependent on Ruby gems and actually was heavily integrated with Ruby gems. So when you run the application and you're you know, booting up an instance of your app, it would figure out what gems you needed by scouring the hard drive. And in our case, that's time wasted when a user is actually trying to connect to the application. So we really want to determine what gems you need and the, and the load path before you deploy the app. And Gem uh, Bundler is a tool that is uh, part of Rails 3 that does that for you. Also, you have uh, first-class integration with other ORMs besides Active Record. Uh, Active Record is what everyone knows from Rails, but if you were to take a look at Data Mapper, you'd find it's very similar. Uh, also, you have better routing because it uses Rack a little bit more. Uh, you have more integration options with JavaScript. You can choose jQuery, or I suppose you could easily integrate Clojure into it if you wanted to. And you have all the Rails conventions on top of that that everyone has grown to love. So let's talk about the APIs. And these are the APIs for Java. Uh, we've created, well, Ryan's created wrappers for them. So first of all, you have the user API. And that means you can build an app and say, anyone from this domain or from any domain can log in. And you can use Google uh, login to take care of that. So you don't create a user pool or passwords or anything. You just let people use a Google account. Uh, there's a data store API. Ryan's created wrappers that um, wrap the Java API from Ruby, uh, and then his data mapper API works on top of that. You also have a memcache API that is very much like the memcache that you've used on any other service. It's been modified slightly to work with App Engine. You have a mail API that lets you send and receive mail. Uh, you have a URL fetch API, and that's actually quite critical because you can't open sockets or create threads. And obviously, if you have timeouts and you want to create timers, you need threads. So we have a URL fetch API that is going to be compatible with NetHTTP. If you import our uh, API, you should be able to use your, your old gems, and they will function, uh, even though you're not using URL fetch. If you write a new application, you probably want to go ahead and, and use URL fetch. Uh, there's an images API, and we actually had a, a contributor that created a wrapper around the Java low-level API for that, and I can show you how that works a little later. There's a logger API that, for Rails, for example, you would send your logs to this instead of trying to write them to disk. In, uh, on App Engine production, you can't write to the disk, so you need to take advantage of that. There's a testing API, XMPP service, and there's a task queue. OK, so uh, real briefly, uh, the app server, like I said, there's a server container that you run inside of. You have a local implementation of, of these APIs that you can run locally without having to set up that server. Uh, and it also emulates the production environment with a few caveats. For deployment, you basically create an app ID. It can be my app ID at appspot.com, or you can specify custom domain. You have the ability to deploy static files, resource files, and other metadata. And with uh, some 
you know, deployment strategies, you build your app and your app itself might spit out the public files and then you have to come up with a strategy for deploying those separately. In our case, you put it in the public folder, it gets pushed out to production and that public folder is stored on a set of caching servers that are always available and always fast. And you basically are going to mask those URLs from ever hitting your application. Okay, there's also an administration console. You can create an application and then invite other developers with a Google account to develop uh, your app. And any one of you can deploy new versions of your application. You can, from that admin console, browse the data store and manage indexes. You can look at error logs and look at how long each page is taking to load, et cetera. You can analyze traffic. You can look at stats, schedule tasks. And also, you can um, roll out new versions of your app. You can test an application without deploying it. If it seems to function, you use the admin console to deploy that version of your app. And of course, you could roll back if you need to. OK, so that is my demo that I can run for you. I'm just telling it to run dev app server in the local environment. Uh, that's the same command that you'd have on Python or Java, but it's a .rb. And now if I were to load this, uh, well, there it is. I mean, it's just saying hello. One of the links off our blog is this. I'm going to take uh, this, copy this right here. So in here, I have these two gems. And also, I have a configure U that I'm just going to copy here. I use our middleware to configure the application ID. Uh, it's just called application ID in this case. And it's a guest book. I'll let that start up here. I basically copied this uh, guestbook from source. It is requiring Sinatra DM core. It has a couple maps, and there's an ERB template shoved into the end of it. So if I, uh, now it's running. Uh, there it is. So I can type in here. It's going to, hello. And that's all it takes. I didn't have to create a migration. I didn't have to really create schema. There's, there's, a, there's a model in here that describes this. It's right here. It says uh, you've got a couple properties. You've got an ID and you've got a message. And really, that's all there is to it. There are some issues with JRenet App Engine. It's not officially supported, but there are people like myself at Google that contribute. We also have people in the community that contribute. It's all out there on code.google.com, and anyone can find a bug and fix it, submit a patch, et cetera. Um, and also, another issue that people run into is that the time to spin up a new JRuby instance is currently slow, but there are some ways to get around that, like you can create a, some form that's doing a bunch of stuff that you don't want to refactor. You, you leave that as Ruby. There's another view that people see all the time that's just doing reads out of the database. You might create a, a Java or Doobie servlet that handles that piece, so there are strategies for making it faster.